This is Salif Keita, the legendary musician from Mali, who is considered as one of the most influential musicians on the African continent. Known as the golden voice of Africa, when Salif Keita decided to become a professional musician, he faced bigger difficulties than simply securing a gig. The first challenge was that he was born with albinism, a condition widely discriminated against in Africa. Number two was that he comes from a royal family who are descendants of Sunjata Keita, the 13th century founder of the Kingdom of Mali. For anyone in such a family to become a professional singer rather than employ griots to sing their praises was virtually unthinkable in the 1960s. However, through the power of music, Salif Keita eventually overcame the pain of being ostracized and gained worldwide acclaim as the foremost ambassador of people living with albinism. In this episode of African Biographics, we cover the story of Salif Keita, the legendary musician who is considered as the golden voice of Africa. The man known as Salif Keita was born on 25 August 1949 in Joliba, a village outside Bamako, the capital of Mali. Salif Keita grew up in Joliba during the last years of French colonial rule. Mali became independent in 1960. Young Salif was one of ten children in a family of noble lineage as he was a direct descendant of Sunjata Keita, a legendary Mandinka warrior king who founded the Empire of Mali in the 13th century. Salif Keita was born with albinism, a condition caused by the absence of melanin pigmentation in the skin. The condition is often misinterpreted as an ill omen in his native Mali and in many parts of Africa. Society perpetuates harmful beliefs about people with albinism who are often shunned, ridiculed, and even killed for ritual practices. Growing up, Salif Keita even feared that he might be sacrificed as albinos had been in ancient times. This condition made Keita an outcast in his own community. In spite of their royal lineage, Salif Keita was raised not in an environment of royal affluence but in a poor farming household. However, his family maintained the pride of their ancestry and of the ancient social structure. As a child, Salif Keita's family were unable to protect him once he started school. There were about 500 students in the school that he was enrolled in and he was the only one with albinism. As such, he was bullied, but he quickly learned how to defend himself. Despite these challenges that he faced at school, Salif Keita was a good student and his dream was to become a teacher. However, after he finished his studies, the doctor at the training school told him that he couldn't be a teacher because of the poor eyesight caused by his depigmentation. Another reason that was given as to why he couldn't pursue teaching was because he would scare the children. It was Salif Keita's father, Sina Keita, who was indirectly responsible for his discovering of music at a very young age. Sina Keita had a griot, that is, a storyteller musician that worked for him. Sina Keita's griot was named Kaba and he often played the balafon. Young Salif liked the sound of the music that Kaba produced because for him, from the very beginning, the music had power and was magical. Salif Keita also started honing his vocal skills at that young age. The superstar attributes the power of his voice to the isolated practice he got as a child. When he was about 12 years old, the young man learned to sing by shouting in the fields. Salif Keita used to shout for over 8 hours every day in the fields for the 3 months out of the year during the summer when he was on vacation from school. At first people thought he was crazy, but when he shouted the monkeys kept away. The fact that the monkeys kept away was good news for everyone in the village. They left him alone. Salif Keita says all of this practice is what gave him the strong voice to sing his music. But here's the thing, initially Salif Keita didn't want to be a musician. In Mali, people from a noble household don't make music, that job is for the griots. But Salif Keita had no choice because of his limited career options. Later, he even said that he had to choose between being a musician, a delinquent, a criminal or a thief. Unfortunately, Salif Keita paid a heavy price when he responded to his calling as a musician. His choice to pursue music violated the occupational prohibitions of his noble status. His family also didn't want him to become a musician. They tried to stop him by all means. But Salif Keita remained adamant about the path he had chosen. Consequently, his family disowned him. In 1967, Salif Keita went to Bamako, the capital, and began singing in the city's smoky bars and clubs. It was also around this time that he taught himself to play the guitar. When he came to the scene in Bamako, the royal band and the ambassadors were the most influential orchestras in Mali. 
At the time, the music in Francophone Africa was undergoing the greatest transformation in its history. This rapid change in the music arena involved embracing a strong indigenous identity while at the same time absorbing modern trends that came through European instruments, especially amplified guitars. It was in this exciting, unpredictable, and very dynamic environment that Salif Keita came and somewhat fitted in. Young Salif Keita met a saxophonist by the name Tidiani Kone who was the leader of the rail band. The rail band was a popular and influential dance band that included Guinean vocalist and chora player Mori Kante. Whether because of urbanism or to save his family from embarrassment or both, legend has it that at Salif Keita's first performance with the rail band in 1969, he draped a towel over his head in order to hide his face. Soon enough, being part of this band brought Salif Keita national recognition. He had gone from being an outcast to now becoming a celebrity. Within a few months, he had been nicknamed the Golden Voice by an adoring press and public. Approval from his family, or at least acceptance, soon followed. The highlight of Salif Keita's time in the rail band was the release of the song Sunjata in 1972. This song was a tribute to his illustrious ancestor Sunjata Keita. Well, Salif Keita left the group in 1973 and some contemporary reports said that this was because of a falling out with Mori Kante who had joined the rail band earlier in the year on the balafon but who immediately began lobbying to take over some of Salif Keita's vocals. And so after leaving the rail band, Salif Keita found work with the resident band of a club called The Motel. This group that he joined was called the Le Ambassadeurs du Motel and they incorporated in their Malian classical music, Congolese rumba, French and English pop, American soul, Cuban salsa and the Argentinian tango. After joining the group, Salif Keita and the group's Guinean guitarist Kante Manfila started talking about turning things around. With this in mind, they introduced Malian classical sounds into their music repertoire. The results of this change to their sound were amazing. Salif Keita and Kante Manfila had given a new dimension to the music of Guinea and Mali. And so guided by the magic of Salif Keita, the group Les Ambassadeurs du Motel provided the soundtrack to the new era for post-independence Mali. In 1977, Seko Toure, the president of Guinea, made Salif Keita an officer of Guinea's National Order of Merit. Guinea's president Ahmed Seko Toure had indeed discovered Salif Keita in 1974 during an official visit to Mali where he became mesmerized by the singer-songwriter's talent. Seko Toure was also deeply in love with the arts. Under him, Guinea was the first nation in Africa to actively pursue a cultural policy that was aimed at the modernization of their traditional musical and artistic forms. This is why Seko Toure invited Salif Keita to Guinea's capital Conakry and made him an officer of Guinea's National Order of Merit. Ahmed Seko Toure also issued Salif Keita with a diplomatic passport. Unfortunately, the political climate back home in post-independence Mali was quickly becoming chaotic, especially under the dictator Musa Traore. At the time when Salif Keita and the Le Ambassadeurs du Motel were becoming a household name, Mali was under the leadership of Musa Traore. The military man Traore burst into the Malian political scene in November of 1968. Based on growing popular discontent with Modibo Keita, the Malian father of independence, a group of young officers including Lieutenant Musa Traore overthrew him on 19 November 1968. This group of young officers then set up a military committee for national liberation which abolished the constitution. Musa Traore was the leader of this committee and officially became the president of the republic on 19 September 1969. All political activity was banned and a police state was run by Captain Tiokoro Bagayoko, Musa Traore's right-hand man. Informers within Mali monitored academics and teachers who were considered to be the most vocal opponents of the military rule. Captain Tiekoro Bagayoko, the now highly influential Malian politician and military man, became the artistic patron and leading benefactor of the Le Ambassadeurs du Motel, the group to which Salif Keita belonged to. As time went on, the political situation in Mali had come to a head. The leader of the nation, Musa Traore, became increasingly paranoid. In common with many military leaders who seized power this way, Musa Traore now saw plots being hatched all around him, leading to the imprisonment of previous allies and suspicion of anyone with popular influence. 
Anyone who opposed the regime or was perceived to be doing so ran the risk of meeting their fate. And this is what happened to Captain Tiokoro Bagayoko, now Musa Traore's former right-hand man. On 28 February 1978, Musa Traore arrested Tiokoro Bagayoko on accusations of plotting a coup against him. A few years later, Bagayoko was assassinated. With the arrest of Tiokoro Bagayoko, the group Le Ambassadors du Motel realized that their position had now become precarious. The band's association with Bagayoko left them in danger. Salif Keita and the band immediately escaped from Mali as soon as they got wind of the arrest of Tiokoro Bagayoko. It soon turned out that they made the right decision, seeing as the authorities had been looking for them. On this occasion, Salif Keita, Kantaman Fila and six other bandmates packed their bags in a hurry in the dead of the night and headed south to Mali's border with the Ivory Coast. By the time they arrived at the Ivory Coast border checkpoint, it was 4.30 am and the group was very exhausted. And so Salif Keita and the band now had to start a new life in the Ivory Coast. When they got to the Ivory Coast, the band changed their name to the Le Ambassadors International. At first, the band struggled to adjust to their new home in Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. They were flat broke and were without instruments, and so they were forced to rent equipment for the shows that they had in Abidjan. During the night, Salif Keita and the group would secretly use the recording studios at the state broadcaster RTI with the help of a sound engineer by the name Musa Komara. During this time, the group produced an album that had five tracks including the powerful and very popular song Manju, which became an overnight success in West Africa. Manju was Salif Keita's song of praise for Guinea's first president, Ahmed Sekotoure, who had made him an officer of Guinea's National Order of Merit in 1977. Sekotoure had come to power in 1958, 60 years after the death of his great-grandfather, Samore Toure, who had led the fight against French colonial rule in West Africa from 1882 until his capture in 1898. Salif Keita felt indebted to President Ahmed Sekotoure because he was the only politician who accepted him as he was. The title of the song Manju refers to the Toure clan known as the Noble Sense of Mande, a region in modern-day Guinea and Mali. The lyrics of the song are specifically addressed to Ahmed Sekotoure. Salif Keita, who had been rejected by his own country, wanted to immortalize his feelings of gratitude to Sekotoure. The title of the album, which carries the song Manju, is a reference to the authenticity cultural policy which was popular at the time, whereby governments in Africa encouraged artists to return to the source for inspiration and unearth the positive values of the past for the edification of modern society. The song Manju became a huge hit, and many decades later it is still hailed as Le Ambassadeurs and Salif Keita's finest record, an African classic. However, by the time Salif and Le Ambassadors had created and released the song for Sekotoure, he had become a dictator and had turned the country of Guinea into a bloodbath. Salif Keita and Le Ambassadors International were fortunate enough to find a producer who could turn their dreams into reality. This producer, who was from Mali, took them to the United States where they recorded two albums. The producer reportedly gave them a lucrative contract in which 70% of the royalties went to the group. Unfortunately, their master tapes were leaked or stolen and copied without their knowledge. Soon, thousands of pirated copies flooded the West African market even before their songs were officially released. Bitter accusations and counter accusations flew thick and fast between the band members. This situation brought to the fore long simmering tension between Kanteman Fila and his protege Salif Keita. Consequently, Le Ambassadeurs International split up. In his desire to reach a bigger and wider audience, in 1984, Salif Keita settled in Paris, where he performed with the new band Les Super Ambassadeurs. The city of Paris outstripped its nearest rival, London, as the European center of African music in the 1980s. As Salif Keita found his way in a new continent, he performed at events and concerts for the Malian immigrant community. Now a proper professional and expert at the game, Salif Keita launched his solo career with the release of the album Soro in 1987 alongside the French keyboardist Jean-Philippe Raiko under the guidance of the Senegalese producer Ibrahim Silla. The album's phenomenal success set the tone for the world music boom in the late 1980s. 
The success of this album, Sorrow, garnered Salif Keita an invitation to appear in the UK concert for Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday. At the turn of the 20th century, Salif Keita returned to Bamako, Mali, where he decided to reside permanently. His first work after going home, an album called Mofu, which he released in 2002, was hailed as his best album in many years. In Bamako, Salif Keita also opened a club named Mofu de Kalabankoro and also opened his own recording studio named Wanda Productions. Salif Keita intended for the studio to become a platform to support the increasing number of emerging young artists from Mali as well as counteract music piracy. Among his many achievements, Salif Keita was given the Lifetime Achievement Kora Award. Another highlight for him was when he was nominated for a Grammy Award for the Best Contemporary World Music Album in the year 2007. In 2005, the musical legend established the Salif Keita Global Foundation, and the mission of this organization is to end global discrimination, persecution, and genocide against people with albinism. This foundation works to combat negative stereotypes by developing and supporting campaigns promoting positive portrayals of people with albinism. The Salif Keita Global Foundation has received widespread recognition and praise for its incredible work improving the lives of people with albinism in Mali and around the world. Salif Keita has long spoken out on behalf of people with albinism, but on his album, La Difference, which was produced around the end of 2009, he sang about the subject for the very first time. The title track in the album, La Difference, encapsulates Salif Keita's life story. In the track, the singer calls others to understand that difference does not mean bad and to show love and compassion towards albinos like everyone else. In the song, Salif Keita sings the following, and I quote, my skin is white, my blood is black. But that difference is beautiful, something to celebrate. In November of 2018, after a career that spanned 50 years, Salif Keita announced his retirement from recording music. Salif Keita announced the end of his long and storied musical career in order to focus his efforts on raising awareness about albinism and combating prejudice and violence against other albinos in Africa. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.